Good morning. What an impressive turnout on a snowy day, especially as we had such heavy snow last week. you think that would be a big deterrent, but you've come obviously because you have an interest, and this is a big topic. How to motivate your team is a big topic, and you'll see some interesting statistics this morning about what a big challenge we have here in Japan to motivate our teams. So let me begin. My name is Greg Story. I am the president of Dale Carnegie Training in Japan. And as you'll hear, we've been in Japan a long time, and we've been around the world a long time. So we hope to bring this morning for you the product of our experience of adult education. And as I have mentioned to you in print, as leaders in your organizations, often you're giving. You are spending money on your own teams. You are arranging training and seminars and workshops for others, and often you're very busy and you're not getting looked after, and that's why we've got this executive breakfast series, so that your own personal needs are stimulated, expand your horizons a little bit, give you some interesting information, and remind you of all the things you already know that you've possibly forgotten, which is the case for all of us. We're all like that. So this would be something that would be said by someone who is highly motivated. In English, when we say, I got lost in my job, it means that I was so deep into my job, into what I was doing, time just flew by. And then I look at my wife, oh my God, it's 6.30 at night, it's time to go home. Because I was so into what I was doing. That would be a highly motivated person. Time disappears for them because the task is so interesting. They're so enthused with what they're doing. So that's what we're hoping you're going to have more of in your teams as we go forward. Dale Carnegie published this book in 1936. This is a copy of the original uh, title, original cover, and about three years ago published an updated version for the digital age. It's been very, very successful. Japanese versions, this uh, Hitokukasu sold 9 million copies in Japan already. And the recently launched Hitokukasu 2, also selling very, very well. And consistently in the top 10 of non-fiction business books, not only in Japan, around the world, because it's timeless and universal in its appeal. And in the Fortune 500 companies in the States, 90% of those companies are our clients. And I found that there's about 64 Japanese companies in the Fortune 500 listed. And I noticed that about half of those are actually our clients here in Japan as well. So it's good to get that acceptance. We bring an opportunity for companies in Japan to take training developed here all around the world. And we do this for a number of Japanese multinationals now. They develop a program in Japan. They've got operations they've bought overseas or they've had overseas for a very long time. And they want the same quality of training delivered in the same way in that local language with those local customs. So being across the world in 91 countries where we have offices, we cover a lot more countries than that, but we have on the ground offices in 91. It gives us a capacity for multinationals to take the same training everywhere in the world. We're doing a project for the moment with a uh, very large Danish company. It's a medical uh, company. It's 34 countries around the world. And in a couple of weeks' time, we'll do uh, tranche number four of a rollout program that they're taking globally. We also have been, as I mentioned before, 102 years uh, we started uh, as a training company, probably the oldest training company, corporate training company in the world. And certainly in Japan, 51 years, we would be amongst, if not the oldest, one of the oldest continuously running training companies. So what we try to bring is that history, that experience, and we change as you change. As clients say to us, we need this, then we create a new scope. As clients say, this is now a new issue, we create new curriculum. So even though we're very well established, we are always current because you keep us current as our clients. One of our biggest fans is Warren Buffett. Does everyone know Warren Buffett? Does everyone know Warren Buffett? The most successful investor and businessman of all time in all history. You wish you'd bought some of Hathaway 
his company a long, long time ago because we'd be billionaires now, literally. And so he is a big fan. And on our website, you'll find uh, we have a nice video there. It's only 30 seconds, but it's Warren Buffett talking about, I don't have my university diploma. I don't have my graduate diploma in my office. I have my Dale Carnegie diploma, which he's showing here in the office in Omaha. And the reason he has that is for him, it changed his life. And he says it on the video, it changed my life. The most successful business person we've ever had in history says, this Dale Carnegie training changed my life. That's the sort of testimonial you'd like to have, right? So we are very proud that he is so passionate about what we do. And in Japan, uh, Mr. Otani, who's just recently become the president of Shiseido, actually was previously the, the chairman of Coca-Cola, big fan, he did his training at the Dalkani course in New York when he was a young man. Uh, Mr. Murakami, ex-chairman of Google, he is a very big fan. He writes about Dale Carnegie and uh, how that influenced his business career and helped him get to the top. And of course, Atarash San from Johnson Johnson, same thing. They took the Dale Carnegie course when they were younger and this had a big impact on their ability to be good with people. And that ability to be good with people has transformed their careers by transforming their teams and took them ahead of everyone else to the very top. About six months ago or so, I noticed that we're sending off these survey forms all the time after the training to the headquarters in America. And they're always pretty good scores, you know, the satisfaction rate's always pretty high. And I thought, well, I wonder what the aggregation, what the total would be if we put all of those different seminars and workshops and courses that we do into one big bag, all trainers, all courses, everything, and we got a picture of what our satisfaction rates would be. And this is the number that came back from the States. They said, we've aggregated everything over five years. Your average satisfaction rate is 97.7%. So that's a pretty reasonable number. And it says that the ideas that Dale Carnegie came up with 102 years ago are still relevant. The way we've developed the training and for adult learners over these 100 plus years is still very uh, credible for our clients and people are very highly satisfied with what we're doing. Today, we're going to look at the impact of management on people's motivation and engagement. How, by demonstrating we care about our teams, we will get that what we call discretionary effort. This is going the extra, doing more than is expected, doing more than you're getting paid for. We'll deal with some of the leading theories on motivation very quickly. And then we'll look at how to give praise and recognition because this will come up as a theme in terms of what people are looking for. Now, very disappointingly, we found that getting told I'm very satisfied with my boss is not necessarily meaning I'm highly engaged or highly motivated. Because I know if I, if I had, uh, you know, 43% of my team say, oh, we're very satisfied with Greg, I'd be pretty happy. Oh, that's pretty good. What we found, though, was that of those 43, only half of them were actually engaged. So often we might think, oh, everyone's very happy with me, therefore they're engaged. What our research showed was that was not the case. <coughs> so don't presume because people are saying we're happy, or even very happy, that it means they're engaged. We need to do more than just make them happy. And those who are somewhat satisfied, not unhappy, but somewhat satisfied, well, only 19% of that group were engaged, with one in five. So again, these are very low numbers. So getting a highly engaged, motivated employee is not such an easy thing to do, even though they're satisfied. It says we're satisfied, but maybe not enough. So what is engagement? It's really two things. It's the intellectual and the emotional commitment to deliver high performance, to care about having high performance. And a very simple way of thinking this is, Hard skills, knowledge, experience, hard skills on one side, must have that, but also attitude. If you have someone who's got a lot of intelligence, very technically capable, but they don't care 
about their people as a leader or as a colleague. They don't care about their colleagues. They don't care about human relations in the company. They just care about themselves. That's a difficult person to have in your team. Alternatively, if they're really friendly, great with people and they're useless, that's not so great either, right? Being, being happy and hopeless isn't much help. We want them to be very good with people, but very good in their skill base. If we get that combination, that's the type of engagement of brain and heart, mind and spirit that we want. And what happens from there is we have the competency, we have the passion. This leads to that extra effort. Now, from that extra effort, we get innovation. Because if you don't care, why would you bother innovating? If you are not committed to the organization, why would you care about improving processes? If you are not highly engaged, why would you care about coming up with something better? You just do your job, pick up your pay, and then have your after work life, which is your main focus. So these are the things we found in defining engagement. We have to have the mind and the heart working together to get that innovation. What we found was there's a trigger point to get to a highly engaged state. And that trigger point is feeling valued. When employees feel that their boss values them, a couple of things start to happen emotionally. One thing is they become more inspired to try harder. They become more enthusiastic to see the enterprise succeed. They feel trusted and empowered to be delegated to and to come up with ideas and suggestions. And they also get confidence. Now, when we ask people to step up, when we ask people to do something new, we're putting them into, for them, what is a very vulnerable situation. They have fears of failure. They have fears of coming up short. They worry, oh, am I up to the task? I've been asked to do this new thing. I've never done it before. I'm not really sure if I can do this. So we have to make sure they feel valued and that we trust them to learn how to do it, that they can make mistakes on the way through because it's part of a learning process. If we say to people, please step up, and immediately they step up and make a mistake, and bang, we whack them, well, they realize, oh, that was a bad idea. I better stay very quiet. Teishise in Japanese, right? Low posture, right? Keep a low profile. So they'll never step out again. So by valuing them and telling them that their job is an integral part of the success of this organization, they feel more confident to step up. And once they have these emotions, being inspired, enthusiastic, feeling empowered, with that confidence there, they are able to become engaged. The trick is, how do we make them feel valued? Now, if you've got a partner, we have the same problem. We know we love our partner, but sometimes we don't tell them we love them. Because they know, right? They know that. We know. We've been married for a long time. We know that. Well, no, they don't know that. The same with our employees. Oh, we value you. You're an important person around here. You know that. Well, no, they don't know that. We have to actually articulate it. We have to keep telling them that they're valued. Keep making them feel they're valued. Not in a fake way, in a sincere way we tell them they're valued. Now, we did some research on engagement, and we found, basically, that 26% of people around the world, globally, were engaged. 45% were partially engaged, and nearly 30% were disengaged. That was a global part of the survey. In the Asia-Pacific region, half of the people were disengaged. And in Japan, shockingly, we found 77% of the Japanese people were disengaged. Now, I know myself that when you ask Japanese people to fill out a survey and you give them a choice between one and five, they'll all pick three, right? That's a very typical response in Japan when you're doing surveys. And we know that Japanese people are very conservative in talking about their companies. But even saying that, we found that that was still a very, a very high level of disengagement. And other uh, surveys done by other Survey companies like Gallup uh, show the same sorts of results. Towers Watson show the same sorts of results. That across the board, whenever they did the Japanese and the foreign groups as a same test, 
the results always came out that Japanese scores were lower. So even if you take out the cultural component, generally speaking, Japanese engagement scores are pretty low. Now we found that there were three things that really triggered that feeling of being valued and people becoming engaged. And they're obvious things. Satisfaction with the immediate manager. It's a very obvious thing. How you feel about your boss is going to have a big impact on your engagement. If you're feeling really valued by your boss and, and included, you're going to feel more enthusiastic. The second one there is belief in senior leadership. Now, in any organization, the, the boss, the head, is like the captain of the ship. You know, in the old days, you got on a, a ship with sails and it was made out of wood. And if you got to the other end, you were pretty, pretty fine and pretty happy about that. And you're really thankful for the captain for getting you through the storms and the waves, and traveling a long distance with very little navigation equipment in those days. Today, we still have a sense of that in companies. We've seen so many companies go down. We've seen so many companies go out of business that people really expect senior leadership to deliver. And their belief that senior leadership have got the strategy right, that senior leadership have got the direction right, is very, very important. Now, we know that's obvious. But do they know what the senior direction, sorry, what the senior leadership direction is? Do they know why they're taking the company in this direction? Are they really understanding the rationale? Because often what happens is the middle management, uh, they remind me of those buildings. You see a building being constructed and you can see straight through the building, and you can see the floors, the concrete floors. Middle management remind me often of those concrete floors. Information trickles down from the seniors to the middle managers and that's where it stops, right there. They don't share it with the people below. They don't tell their own teams what they've heard from senior management. It stops right there. So the people at the bottom often have no idea the strategy or the direction that, or the rationale uh, from senior leadership. So the last one there is pride in the organization. Pride in the organization. So that you're happy to tell your family, yes, I work for Dale Carnegie Training Japan. You're happy to tell your friends, yes, I work for this company. Now, in Japan, we have black companies, you know, this list of black companies, and your company's name is in that list. Imagine, you are listed as a black company in Japan because you treat your workers so poorly. How would you feel about working for a company like that? Where's the pride in your organization? I'm not going to name names because we all know who they are, right? But you don't want to be one of those companies. Imagine what the engagement levels must be around there be pretty low, right? So if these three are working, and that pride in the organization, again, it's a bit like telling your partner you love them. It's a bit like telling your team you appreciate them. It's not a bad idea to keep talking positively about the organization. But often what happens as leaders in big organizations, the leader of that division or section will whine and whinge and complain about senior management, have got it all wrong, or that other division, my God, they're clueless. And they talk down their company to their team because they, sometimes they imagine that bonds us together. It's like us against them, except the them is their own company. So a crazy idea. These sorts of things happen. So as leaders, we have to be constantly recognizing to have pride in the organization. We have to talk up the company. We have to be very positive. We don't talk badly about other divisions. Right? So little things can make a big difference. Now, interestingly, I say here it's easy to move the needle. That's the, the gauge, you know, to go from disengaged to engaged, to move that gauge, that needle and the gauge across. Isn't that difficult? Because we found of those uh, one third who said, one in three people who said, my manager does care about me. Of those people, half were engaged. But of the two thirds who says, no, my manager does not care about me, only 17% were engaged. So what it tells you straight away is, mathematically, if you can get your managers, if you can get your leaders at every level to really help their team to feel they care about them as people and keep, care about their careers, wow, you're going to jump that engagement level very, very easily and very, very quickly. Now, when I was growing up, there was no concept that the boss took an interest in you and your personal life. That was like work, personal life, complete separation. That's not the case today. 
We have aging population. That means we have aging parents. We have burdens, because people are living longer now, that maybe previous generations didn't have. We're having fewer children, right? So there are, there are different pressures on us than in previous generations. So people want to know that you take their whole picture into consideration, not just their work picture. There's a lot more stress in our lives than there was previously, so it impacts on health. There's a whole range of things that didn't occur before which occur now. So the managers have to take a bigger interest in their people and care and show, not fake care, real care, that they are interested in them as whole, holistic people. So we did this survey. Uh, we've done a few engagement surveys and I've just brought out some of the polling results. They're quite interesting. Which of the following has the greatest impact on employee engagement? There were seven things you could choose from. The left-hand side, the numbers there are the, uh, just a Japanese, pure Japanese group. We did in that language, it was Japanese. And the other one on the right was a series of mixed groups, some Japanese, some foreigners, a bit like today. And you look at the contrast. The highest one came out was satisfaction with my immediate manager had the greatest impact on employee engagement, which we saw before. Relationship with your immediate supervisor. But the Japanese scores were interesting. One in two of the Japanese team said, that is really important for me to be engaged whereas only 31% for the mixed group. And then belief in senior leadership, again, that came up. Pride in the organisation came up. So those original findings that we did globally were duplicated in here in Japan and showed exactly the same results. Now, the interesting one for me is number five, opportunities for advancement. A mixed group were more interested in opportunities for advancement in their company than the Japanese group, very much lower number. That's probably more of a cultural issue. The next poll is, which, uh, what action do you think has the most impact on employee engagement? Now, this is very interesting. And again, the Japanese results and the uh, mixed group results, some similarities, some differences. But look at this one. Showing appreciation and giving recognition, number one on both counts. Right, so this is how to have impact. We've got to be communicating that. Then we had collaborating on decisions, this means I have some opportunity to input into what's happening around here. Giving clear direction wasn't such a big thing in the mixed group, but for the Japanese team, they wanted to be very clear about where they're going. So if your team's got Japanese uh, team members in it, you might need, as a foreigner like me, to give more direction than perhaps you'd, you think necessary. And then the other one was aligning the workforce with the big picture. For the mixed group, it wasn't such a big deal, but for the Japanese team, that was important. All right, so get everyone together going in the same direction. We did another one. As a manager, which action is hardest to consistently implement? And this is very interesting. We had a, a Japanese group, and I've got two mixed groups there, uh, recent ones we did. So what have we got here? We've got, say, I acknowledge and care about my employees' personal lives. All right, for the Japanese group, that was thought to be rather difficult. Okay, interesting. Not so much for the mixed group. I give them reason to feel confident in my leadership ability. About one in eight in both cases. Um, I build trust, credibility and respect. For the Japanese team, they felt as a leader that was a difficult thing for them to do. And then I align employees' goals with those of the organisation. The Japanese team didn't have much trouble with that, but the mixed groups did. So it's a bit of variation between the two groups. But these consistently come up in terms of what are some things that are occupying people. So some of our challenges. When people are not engaged, often it's because they don't know what I should do. They feel a bit lost. They might be a new hire, the company may have changed direction, there might be some new cultural initiative going on and they feel a bit lost. I don't know what to do. Well that means educate. I don't know how to do it. Again, you might have stepped up in the position or be given more responsibilities or again, a new product launch or a new direction, uh, I don't know what to do. Well, that's training. I don't believe I can do it. And it's intriguing. We often hear from multinational companies who've got uh, big international operations where they move people around all the time that they have a lot of trouble getting Japanese team members to go overseas. And part of the problem is they don't get selected. Uh, they say, look, we're going to promote you. 
and your next position is going to be in Shanghai or in New York or somewhere. And often the Japanese team member will say, I'm not ready yet, maybe in two years' time. Very shy, very conservative, you know, I don't believe I can do it. So they don't take the job. And, you know, foreigners go, I'll have a go, you know, put it to pick me. I'm up for promotion, you know, we're ready to go. So this is where the leader needs to challenge and inspire people to step up. And I don't know why you want me to do it, which means, don't you know, man, I'm busy. Uh, have you seen my inbox? Have you seen the number of emails I've got? I'm already maxed out, and you want me, me, to do this? Are you nuts? Right? What well, is your job anyway? You're the boss. Why am I doing your work? Why are you delegating this to me and I'm already too busy? Right? So this is, we'll talk about delegation a little bit later, but you need to explain why they're the person to do it, why it's good for them, and sell the delegation. Often, delegation's not sold, it's dumped on people. You know, you come along and whoomp, drop it on a desk. Here's the report or here's the task and I want it done by. And that's the last they ever hear from you. And then, you know, you start correcting what's wrong, usually too late, finding fault. We're not selling the delegation. And then, I don't want to do it. Now, I discovered in Japan that no one says, I don't want to do it. What they say to me is, I don't understand. Wakarimasen, you know. Which I discovered is actually code word in a lot of cases for, you're nuts. This is a stupid idea, crazy gaijin boss, crazy foreigner boss. I don't want to do this. This is a bad idea. I'm not going to do it. So this then comes back to exactly motivation, trying to get them to understand why this is important. Now, we have some common misperceptions about people working for us. We think that everybody's the same. Like us, the boss, or everybody wants the same thing out of work. Money, promotion, recognition, status, right? Everybody wants to be promoted. Of course you all want to be promoted. You want to, you know, you want to be manager like me, you know, working 16 hours a day, you never see the family. You all want to be like me, right? Of course. Or, um, of course everyone wants to live up to my expectations as the boss. Well, these are very common misperceptions. At your tables, please take a few moments and just discuss. Do you think these things about people? Do you think that you work for bosses who thought these things about people, that they actually thought that everyone wants to be promoted? Everyone Does everyone want to be promoted? Does everyone want to step up in their career? Are these things that actually are real? Or is this just we think these things, but in reality, people are different. So please, at your tables, we're going to take a few moments. We'll have a little discussion about that point. So please go ahead. At your discables, discuss whether these are common or true or you disagree with it. Please start. Okay, let me, let me just stop it there for a moment. Now we'll give you a little test. Okay, a little test. What do employees want? Okay, we think about some things employees want. All right, recognition, fulfilling work, uh, clear career path. Respect for a balanced life, competitive compensation benefits, okay? Here is A, B, C, D, E, F. The employees, how they rank these and how the employers rank them. So you're going to rank them in which would be the, the highest order. A, positive relationship with one's manager. Recognition and appreciation is B. Stimulating and fulfilling work, that's C. D, clear career path and growth opportunities. E, managers who respect a balanced life, and F, competitive compensation and benefits. So, A, positive relationship with the manager, B, recognition and appreciation, C, stimulating fulfilling work, D, clear career path and growth opportunities, E, managers who respect a work, balanced life, and F, competitive compensation benefits. So, as a leader, please think about what your team value and Imagine how they would rank it, okay? What do you think your employees' ranking would be? Your assumption 
as the employer of what you think your employee's ranking of these items would be. So please just write A, B, C, D, F and attach a number, a ranking from, what is it, one to, uh, one to six? One to six there if you've got a pen. If you don't have a pen, I think we can find you some pens. Okay. And just have, a, have, a, have an estimation of what you think your employees are valuing more than something else. So you're trying to second guess what your, uh, your own team. So A is a positive relationship with the manager, B is recognition and appreciation, C is stimulating fulfilling work, D is a clear career path and growth development uh, opportunities, E is manager who respects a balanced life, and F is competitive compensation and benefits, right? So that's the list of things. How would you imagine? Uh, you rank them, how do you think employees rank them? Okay, how do we go? This is what we found. Employees said recognition appreciation number one, but leaders thought compensation, remuneration and benefits would be number one. Employees thought that a positive relationship with a manager would be number two, but the leaders thought career path would be number two. Number three, by employees stimulating fulfilling work, managers thought the same thing. Number four, compensation, but number four for the managers was respect and balanced life. Number five, for the employees respect and balanced life, but in fact uh, recognition and appreciation is what the leaders thought. And then finally, clear career path was the last one ranked by the employees, but number two from the employers. So what this shows us when we do these sorts of surveys is there's a very big perception gap between what we as leaders think our team need. Now, we talked before about feeling valued, relationship with the direct supervisor, belief in senior leadership, pride in the organisation. We're making assumptions about what people want here. So we have to really have good communication to understand what people individually want. So there are some tested theories on this. One very famous, Abraham Maslow, The Hierarchy of Needs. Douglas McGregor, Theory X and Theory Y Management. Uh, Frederick Herzberg, The Two Factors Theory. And then finally, Dale Carnegie, Human Relations Principles. And we're going to run through these very quickly just to refresh your memory on some of the theories about motivation and getting teams motivated. Maslow's hierarchy, we have survival, security, belonging, importance, and then self-actualization. That was the thought. And the point about Maslow's theory is you need to get to one level before you can move to the next level, basically. So the point there is with survival, it's like air, food, drink, it's warmth, shelter, sleep. You've got to be able to take care of yourself. That's the first. You don't have that, forget about everything else. And then security, it's you know, safe, you know, medical taken care of, uh, things are in order, it's stable, okay, there's no chaos. Once you get those things, then you can start worrying about belonging, that sense of family, the team, uh, friendships, affection, mutual interest. You start to move up the scale. So we assume the first two, that we've got health and we've got safety and we've got you know, shelter and enough to live on. So at this point, we start to look at how we take people to the next level. Okay? Now, importance, being valued. We talked about that before. So develop that self-confidence. They feel they're given responsibility. They feel they're achieving. They're getting ahead. They're respected. They respect other people. And then feeling respected. So this is driving you up. So in Maslow's hierarchy, they're the basics of where people need to move. Now, McGregor had a very interesting idea. Theory X leaders basically didn't see people in a positive way. They felt that, well, people are lazy. You know? they, uh, they try to avoid work. I've got to be on them all the time. You know, uh, use the whip, okay? Use the whip to get people to do things. Um, give them direction all the time, micromanage them. Uh, they won't take responsibility, so there's no point delegating it. It's faster if I do it myself. Fatal words from any leader. It's faster if I do it myself. If ever you catch yourself saying, it'll be faster if I do it myself, ring us straight away and book yourself in for our leadership training because we do a big portion on delegation 
to get that type of vocabulary out of your life and get the work out of your life as well because that's a really fatal thing for a leader. They're only interested in a safe job and picking up their pay and going home and uh, you know they don't care about being part of the team. So in McGregor's ex-leader, it's a very harsh view of people. The Y leader, by contrast, was work is as natural as play. People enjoy it. Uh, people can, can direct themselves. You know, you can delegate, they can self-lead. Um, yes, they're, they're motivated by rewards. It doesn't mean monetary rewards. could be praise. Um, most people enjoy to take responsibility to have, uh, you know, the running of a project. Uh, they do have creative and ingenuity. We just got to get them to bring it out. And, uh, yeah, goals can be met through strong teams. So these two leaders are totally different in how they see people. The first one is a fault finder, a mistake catcher, a bad finder. The second one is a possibility finder, a good finder. You know, it's the old classic. I do nine things well. My boss says nothing. I do one thing wrong. And all I get is grief and complaining from my boss, right? The classic. We ignore the nine that are done well, but we hit the one that's done incorrectly. We're all guilty of it, okay? What, Matt, what we're saying here with McGregor's theory is that this type of leader sees the nine as well as the one. And they recognize the nine. They don't lose sight of the balance, okay? Now, Herzberg uh, had a very interesting idea. He said there were maintenance factors for motivation. These are maintenance factors. Having a good team collegiate relationship, having good work conditions, having a salary. And this is very interesting. He saw salary as a maintenance aspect of motivation, not a motivator in itself. Status, only maintenance. Oh, you're now executive director or you're now vice president. That's going to be very stimulating for you, isn't it? Maybe not. Maybe people just see that as a natural progression. That's what I should get. That's not a motivator. I expect that. And then security. Yeah, you're, you have security of employee here. Your job's going to continue. Well, of course it's going to continue. I expect that. So things that often we think are motivators from an employee point of view, may not necessarily be seen the same way. What were motivators from Hertzberg? Feeling that they've achieved. Now, why would you know you've achieved? This is the point about the leader giving you something to do that you could look at and say, I did that and I did a good job because I was told and recognized I did a good job. Get the recognition. The work itself, now often with engineers, engineers, are a different breed, I've found. For engineers, the challenge of the work is very critical to their motivation. If you give them something too boring, their motivation goes straight down. They are a bizarre bunch of people. They want difficult stuff all the time. And the more difficult it is, the more they love it. That's an engineer. You know, other people gear different ways. Responsibility, I trust you, I delegate to you. That's motivating. And advancement. Yes, you're going to move up in this organization because we see a career path for you. We see you as a future leader of this organization. They were motivating factors. And lastly, the sense of personal growth where you're investing in the training of people's hard skills and soft skills. People feel the company's taking an interest in me. They're paying money or giving up time for me to grow as an individual. I'm being sent on the course. I'm being sent to uh, the conference. I'm representing the company at this particular event. I'm leading the project or whatever it might be. Now, Dale Carnegie worked on the basis that motivation comes from the leader and how they treat the people. If the leader has got good communication skills, good people skills, that will motivate people because often, without us perhaps being aware of it, we're demotivating people all the time. We are doing things which annoy people. And what he discovered was a whole bunch of things you can stop doing and a whole bunch of things you can start doing and motivation will immediately go. One of them is criticizing, condemning, and complaining about people. When we criticize people, what happens? They become defensive. They don't believe it anyway, so it doesn't work. You might feel better, but you've just destroyed their motivation. They feel disgruntled. 
comes up every time. And the key word here is sincere. The other key word is honest. Everyone in this room can spot fake praise immediately. We're all experts in it. You know, gomasuri in Japan, just polishing the apple type of thing. Uh, people know straight away. So it's got to be real. It's got to be genuine. This is not so easy, but to arouse in the other person an eager want. There are 30 of these principles that are not all here today, but these are the things that we as leaders have to think about, that psychological aspect of how to want that person to want to do it. That's a big communication skill. And become genuinely interested in other people. If you see the people as assets, if you see the people as some stepping stone for you on your glorious career to the top, you know, the classic sort of military scenario, you are all died taking the hill and I got promoted to general. <laughs> okay? The classic military scenario. People don't want that scenario. They don't want to die so you can get promoted. They don't want to be working themselves in an early grave so you can be a hero to the bosses. They want you to be genuinely interested in them and their careers and be a good listener. Now, one of the problems with the boss is we talk too much. We know more usually, we've got more experience, we've got more knowledge, uh, information, so we're in the habit of telling people. We have to stop ourselves and let them talk so they feel heard, they feel appreciated, they feel valued, that key word, valued. Shut up, boss, listen. Not easy though, busy life, lots of emails, lots of stuff to do, lots of meetings, uh, do this, do that, move on. We've got to slow down a little bit and have that personal engagement. Talking about what you want is interesting to you, but it's only interesting to you. If you want your people to be motivated, start talking about what they want. Same in sales. If you talk about things to your client that are of extreme interest to you, the salesperson, you're not going to get a sale. The client wants to know you're interested in what they want. Same with the teams. They want to know you're interested in their interests. Okay? Make them feel important. Again, do it sincerely. Don't try fake praise. People pick it up straight away. Thing two, we forget that we were 20, 25, 30 at some point. We forget that we made mistakes and we are today the total product of all the mistakes we made. That's what we are. We are a collection of errors and mistakes we've made in our lives that have built us today. That is what our experience is. Your experiences are a collection of mistakes from which you've learnt or things that you've learnt to avoid. But sometimes we forget to give that benefit to younger people or people not as new in, uh, not as, um, I should say, not as experienced in the task. Don't jump on people when they make mistakes. To, and if you've got a they know, you know, it's very rare that you didn't know you made a mistake. It's a pretty rare thing. Talk about the mistakes you made to show them that you're human and you understand. And yes, you, there was a mistake, we have to fix it. This is a great one. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders. We have got mobile phones, iPads, with us 24 hours a day now. We are no longer able to take breaks. I, I realise uh, recently there's been a discussion about airlines, whether they should let people have the mobile phones all the time running in aircraft. And there's quite a, a lot of people who say, no, <laughs> I don't want that. It's hard enough working, you know, you're going to be travelling and working the whole time. At least I can take a break on the aircraft. Well, maybe that will disappear too. But it means that in a very, very busy life, everything gets truncated. So we're tend to be shooting orders because we're moving very fast, very high metabolism. Do this, do this, do this and move on. Well, much better to ask questions because then we're getting them involved in the answers. Let them do a great deal of the talking. Make them, let, uh, make them feel the idea is theirs. See it from their point of view. And then begin with praise and honest appreciation. Oh, this is very interesting. Begin. Think of it. How many times do we start a conversation with our team? David, how's that report coming along? Boom. Straight in there to the meat of what I want to know about. As opposed to, 
David, thank you very much for your contribution in the meeting the other day. We had the 80 managed together there. And you made some very insightful comments, which I think helped the whole group, and I certainly appreciate them. Thank you very much. By the way, how's that report coming along? You hear the tone? You hear the difference? One is starting with something you're recognising what they're doing, and then you move to the thing that you're interested in. And it's got to be genuine. If he didn't have any good insight, and he had actually had a, a pretty miserable insight, and he knows it too, and you said it's a great insight, it doesn't work. It's got to be real. But the point is, when you start conversations with your team, do you begin with something that's praising and appreciating them before you get into the thing that you are thinking of? I've trained myself. If you get an email from me, you will generally get an email from me that says, thanks. It's always the first word I write, thanks, because my habit is to go straight into the meat of what I want to talk about in the first sentence. But I've trained myself to not start like that. I've trained myself to begin and say thank you to people, thank you for this, thank you for that first, and then talk about what I want. It's a similar idea in face-to-face. -face. So again, if there are mistakes, bring them up indirectly. Present honest appreciation, talk about your mistakes, okay, ask questions for your direct orders. Now, in terms of having conversations with people, we said before, in the old way of doing things, we never got that interaction personally with people. Your private life is over here, work life is over here, boss doesn't get involved. Well, that, that era is gone. And in fact, the younger that people become, uh, become in the workforce, or the younger they are in your workforce, the more they want to know you care about their total holistic self. So, you know, what are the things that make them passionate? You know, what are the things that they feel are challenging? What are the things they, they find stimulating, motivating? What sort of opportunities are they looking for? Where are their strengths? Where do they see their strengths? What are they proud about? Now, this could be very casual. It doesn't have to be an interrogation. It doesn't have to be in the office. It could be over drinks after work. It could be having lunch together. It could be having breakfast together. It could be working to, walking towards a client meeting together. Having these sorts of conversations with your team, trying to understand that person in total. What is driving them and therefore taking your conversation and matching it to what they're interested in. Exactly the same as you would do in sales. You'd find out in sales what was the client interested in, what are they trying to achieve, what are the outcomes they want and then you talk in terms of how what you have will help them to deliver the solution for that end goal. It's exactly the same when we're dealing with people. What do they want? How do we arouse an eager want? If you don't know what they want, you can't arouse an eager want. Now, the trick though with praise and appreciation, it, we get it wrong a lot of the time. We say dumb things like, Duco, good job, good job, that was good. He's got no idea which particular job was good or which particular aspect of that job was good. It's just good job. You know, it's sort of praise but it's not very effective because it doesn't get to the point. That doesn't work. What we need is, that was well done. The way that you showed that client how this particular tea product actually has got a much higher satisfaction rating across the board than what they're using now and will make them more effective in their business was well, well articulated. That really helps our company. Here's the context now, because that means we're going to get more sales, more happy clients, more referrals, and I'd like to encourage you to keep doing that, because that's working extremely well. You're doing a really fine job of building trust with the customer. Keep going with that. So now, we're going to practice this a little bit, okay, just in case our, our praise facility is a bit rusty. You know, we often say that there's plenty of praise in stock because leaders make so little use of it, draw down so little of it. So what I'd like you to do, uh, pair up if you can at your tables, if there's pairs or make pairs, and think of someone you work with. You can't do it with the people in the room because you don't know each other well enough, but they will be that person to you. Pick somebody you work with. Think something about that person you can praise. Give them the example of why you're praising them. Put it in context to how this helps the organisation 
and then tell them to keep doing it. So just take a minute or two, think of someone. I'm going to give you a minute to think of someone, then think through those stages, then practice with your partner. The partner today will be that person, and then you'll swap over. Is everyone clear on that? Any questions? I think we could probably make some partners here. Maybe, maybe you two guys can get together and make a partnership. Is that okay? I think we've got even numbers then. Okay. Um, maybe Dylan, do you want to jump in maybe with the higher son there? You can be a partner for a higher son. That'd be good. Okay, so let's take one minute to think about someone. Uh, just first of all, think of the someone. Think of the item that you're going to praise. Think of an example. Think of the context. And then think about the reinforcement. And then after a minute, we'll actually practice. So think first and then we'll practice. Okay, everyone going okay there? You've got, it's got to be someone at work, okay? It's someone preferably who works for you, if possible. And no names, you don't have to tell us a name. I mean, you, Miss or Miss X, or Mr. X, it doesn't matter, that's fine. But the person who's going to be partnering with you today, imagine they're the, the member of staff or they're a member of your team. So they're your, they're your role play today for this particular exercise, okay? All right, so let's go. Try that. Try to tell them what they did well. Give them an example of what they did well. Provide some context of how that helps the organization and then reinforce it. Please start. Go. Okay. Let's just pull it up there. Let's just stop it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very, very, very simple thing. But it's that relationship with the immediate boss, feeling valued, all those things we talked about being recognized, they come down to communication. And these are the soft skills. It doesn't matter what a whiz you are on the IT or the accounting or the technical aspects of engineering. If people don't like you and don't trust you, you're going to have a huge difficulty in getting the team to come with you, either as a colleague or as a boss. So these are the key skills. So the thought that people need these things and the ability to deliver them in a very positive, effective way makes the big difference. So today, have you learned something today? Okay. Okay, so what? You learned something. How will you use it? Because knowledge that's not used may as well have no knowledge at all. It's the same thing. It has to be used. How will you use what you've learned today? So think about putting up an action plan from what you learned today. To be a stronger force for motivating your team takeaways and actually put it into play. Practical application is a critical part of Dale Carnegie. Share it and then polish it. Okay? And then commit. Keep working on it. So if you're interested in having the engagement survey you saw before done in your team, we can deliver that for you. We can bring that in. If you'd like a customized program around any of the soft skills we've covered today, we can obviously do that. We have various existing courses that may match perfectly for what you're looking for. Have a look at those. And then we'll have other workshops. So let me basically finish there and ask for any questions in the remaining time we have. Does anyone have any questions about anything I've covered or things I may not have covered today which are of interest? Who has the first question? Yes, please. The uh, survey findings, uh, when were they done? Because, I mean, you know, the, uh, like the pay, financial thing, all they tend to be ranked low. Things yeah. have changed. So even yeah. in Japan, I think if you make a survey, my guess is that may could change. change. The uh, the main engagement surveys were done in 2012-13, so it's quite recent. It's quite recent. So yes, we often think that yeah, after Lehman shock, people are worried about money. Yes, that's but that's a maintenance factor as far as Herzberg is concerned. That's an expected item. I should be well paid. I should be recognised. They want more than that, which is, I think, the psychological issue that we have to get over uh, in terms of thinking about those things. Where's the next question? Yes, please. Yeah, it was interesting to see the, the criteria and the perce perception gap between employee and employee, the mm -hmm. employer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wonder, how about the, how middle management are thinking or how the employees of small companies are thinking? Because uh, my impression is that the em employee uh, employers know how uh, have a kind of seriousness, seriousness how the market is cruel and how competitive things are, things are. But while employee is uh, let's say in Japanese term daichi mm -hmm. uh, not knowing the mm -hmm. how severe 
mm -hmm. we are much here. So I just wonder. So the question is about the gap between perception of the employees and the seriousness of the economic environment and the managerial perspective on the seriousness of the economic environment. And I think, generally speaking, it comes down to communication. This is where uh, top management may have a very clear view on how much more competitive they've got to be or how market share is eroding or quality levels are deteriorating and the things they need to do. And they may be communicating that it gets as far as middle management. But they don't pass it on. They might pass on the what that people need to be doing. They may be passing on the how of what they need to be doing. But they often forget to tell them the why. And if you understand the why, it changes your perspective because then you have more capability of joining with the organization in the same direction than just being told what you've got to do and how you've got to do it. So I think it's again, it's that image I had of that building with the concrete floors that it just doesn't trickle down very far. It seems to get stuck. So where you have middle management, make sure that they are communicating the direction and the latest changes to the people below them because often they may not be. They may be just keeping it to themselves thinking that you know, they don't need to pass it on or somehow people will know it or they're very busy and they just forget to tell them. It's like classic, you know, you have the, uh, you have the director's meeting and then things come out and uh, no one ever hears or there was an offside at the top levels or top guys or gals went away and then no one ever hears what happened about that or there's a big conference uh, somewhere around the world and people come back and they tell you how, you know, great time they had at the golf course but they're telling you about what happened. We forget to pass it on. So I think that's an issue around more communication than anything else. So here's the next question. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Dealing with, for example, um, mid managers who are really engaged, who have a team very engaged on it, but they, these mid management don't really believe or trust the senior managers. Yeah. How, how what, what kind of people, what kind of recommendation can you do to these mid managers who? had that issue. One of these is that maybe he's getting the information, but it's because he don't trust that, or he's not engaged to mm -hmm. these uh, seniors. Then he don't share it to the staff because he feel, oh uh, well, what they're saying is really crazy. Why am I gonna do that if I mm -hmm. don't agree 100% with that? The question is, what happens when your middle management's not engaged? And you may have people at the bottom who are reasonably motivated or even highly motivated, but their boss is not motivated. So what do you do in that situation? Well, again, it's the same, it's that direct supervisor. It's a senior management job to make sure that middle management is engaged. So there's a breakdown here at the senior levels. Now, interestingly enough, as a training company, uh, in the last probably three, four years, we've been asked to do more and more and more training for senior leaders. Very interesting. Normally, you know, by the time they get to that sort of 50s plus age bracket, uh, they don't get much training. They're, they're tending to organize training for other people. But we've found that for a lot of companies, they need to reinvigorate that le leadership level. Now, in a lot of cases, very ironically, after the Lehman shock, right, or after the bubble, actually, I should go back, after the bubble burst in Japan, uh, things were very tough. Marketing budgets got cut. Training budgets got cut. So a lot of younger, sort of 30s age group people didn't get trained. And because people didn't imagine that it would last two or three decades long, you know, a downturn, they thought it was a couple of years, it got delayed and then delayed, and then finally people realized, oh, this isn't getting any better. Oh, by the way, we better start training people. And those people now are that little bit too senior. And they train the people under them. And they just kept on going. So we find that often we're training senior people who have not been challenged by a new leadership idea in the last 20 years. You know, it's not like they've got 20 years of experience. They've had one year of experience 20 times type of problem, okay? Because there'd be nothing to challenge them. And now the companies are saying, you know, well, these, these people are not retiring at 60 anymore. We need these people to keep working until 70 and 75, and we want them to be more productive as leaders and better leaders. And even though they have not had a lot of leadership training, maybe at all in their careers they did on-the-job training mostly, we now need to put in some more formal training and re-engage and re-stimulate these people so that they can be more effective for the long-term benefit of the company. So it comes back to that point that where the senior leadership is not doing their job, many companies are recognizing that now and then they're learning how to delegate, they're learning how to talk to their middle managers and get them inspired. Uh, the other part of it can be too, if the communication is not very clear 
about the why. Again, middle management might only be getting the what and the how and no why as well. So it's hard to get motivated if you don't know why you, we're doing things. So again, soft skills, gap there around communication. That, that becomes an issue. Who has the last question? Yes, please. Um, going back to satisfaction and um, engagement, how have you seen the attitudes of Japanese people like, within the Japan in different industries change throughout the training of the company? Oh, through when we do our training? Yeah. I think the big insight for us is that uh, we have a number of different courses, okay? So course by course, the, the, the specialization is different. But so we take the Dale Carnegie course itself, which is really about human relation skills. And there are a number of graduates in this room today, actually. The big thing about that course is people realize that all the solutions are inside them, and it's not out there. And so when you, that clicks, when you get the idea that actually when you approach people differently, you'll get a different result. And as they try it, and it works, they become more encouraged to try more. And as they do that, they start to want to take more responsibility. You know, we often have in the graduation class, people talk about the things they learned from the course. And this is very common. People say, I used to keep a very low profile, never volunteered for projects, you know, just did my job and went home. But now I feel more empowered, more engaged. I want to step up. I want to take more responsibility. I want to be the project leader. I want to have that capacity to take my career forward. That's the motivation, because I've realized inside them it's all there. No one's just had the key to unlock what's in them. The course gives them the key. It's not like we got the key and we unlock it for them, but we help them to come to a stage where they can unlock it themselves. And then they realize that dealing with people, ah, this isn't as hard as I was making it for myself, because I was doing a whole bunch of things to make it more difficult. When I stop doing those things and I start doing these things, life gets better. So it switches gears mentally for them. But like Dale Kenny said, for the leader, it's changing your behavior as a leader, which will impact the motivation of your team. Because if you keep approaching people the same direction all the time, you get the same result. Slightly change the angle, you get a different result. If it's the right angle, you get a better result. Thank you very much for coming out on a snowy day. It's still snowing, I see out there, although it doesn't look like it's piling up too much. So please uh, take your care on the way back. And I look forward to seeing you at a Dalkany course or a seminar or a workshop or another one of these seminars again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.